Welcome to Lost in Revision. All of our content is public domain, literature, fairy tales, and folklore. We are here to celebrate the original stories, not just read the modern sanitized versions. We post short segments of stories daily and monthly full episodes where we read and discuss popular classics. Come and find us on Patreon to listen to the full chapters early and without interruption. Our goal is to at least break even to cover our expenses, so any support that you can offer to help us reach that goal helps keep this podcast going and you entertained. All of our music is by Nathan Hubble and is used with his permission. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Chapter 11. Paul's Bad Luck. Part 1. From the Dakotas, after he had completed his contracts there, Paul Bunyan moved over into the Lake States. It is said that he stepped across the Minnesota line carrying his big grindstone under one arm, and Elmer, his famous fore-and-aft moose terrier, under the other in order to balance the weight. Babe, the great blue ox, and Bessie, the yaller cow, were driven on ahead. Babe was laden with all the camp equipment, tools and other property that had to be moved, while Bessie carried only a church bell around her neck so that she could be located by its sound when she got lost as her poor eyesight quite often caused her to go astray in spite of the green goggles, which she always wore. Behind Paul there trailed a long line of loggers bearing their turkeys or blanket rolls, for most of his Dakota crew moved eastward with him. A wonderful parade they all made through the wilderness, and it was a shame that no one had a chance to see it pass except the wild creatures of the woods. Paul did not take his big flapjack griddle with him on his first trip, but came back and got it later. First of all, he located a place for his permanent camp and got all his men started on building the shanties and bunkhouses and stables and other shelters which would be needed. Not until then did he hitch up Jerry and Jenny, his famous mule team, and go after the griddle. Some authorities say that he moved the griddle to the new location by hitching his team to the land the Red River Camp was on and hauling the entire camp, buildings, griddle, and all to the new location. It is more likely, however, that he moved just the griddle, as most of his Red River Camp buildings would have been too small to serve in his new camp. In his Red River camp, he had found the big flapjack so hard to handle that from now on he had sourdough Sam fix up the hot cake rations for the camp in a little different way. Instead of making one big flapjack, the cooks now began making a lot of little ones, not more than three or four feet across. Forty to fifty of these would be tied together in a bundle, and the ration was one bundle to a man, though there were always a few hearty eaters that came back for a second helping. Paul extended the railroad tracks from the mess hall to the griddle, and when the flapjacks began getting brown, the trains would run on regular express service. Each car would be loaded down with bales of flapjacks and a couple of waiters in asbestos suits would perch themselves on top. Then, as they whizzed down the line of tables, they would toss a bale to each man as they went past. This new system saved so much time at breakfast that the men were able to be in the woods long before daylight. Paul established his camp on the Big Onion River, near where the little auger flows into it. From this central location, he worked all the lake states, logging off most of the white pine forests of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. His work in the Dakotas made him enthusiastic about logging on a grand scale, and his operations now began to be probably the greatest ever seen, even surpassing those done from his Red River camp. During the first year, however, that Paul was in his big onion camp, he was not able to get very much timber cut. Bad luck seemed to follow him that year, and a number of extraordinary misfortunes 
fell upon him to delay his work. Because of the evil that dogged his footsteps, his crews were hardly ever able to cut more than a million feet of logs a day, and some days not even that. In the first place, Paul had selected a location that was a rather poor one for logging, although the timber that stretched for hundreds of miles around was the thickest and largest he had yet seen. Thanks for joining us today. Check us out on Patreon. The storytime level is only $3, and you can help us meet our small goal of breaking even and covering our expenses. Your support helps pay for all of the things that podcasting requires and helps keep this show alive and growing. If you can't afford to support us financially, go give us a good review, subscribe or follow, and share with your friends and family. Feel free to fact check us and offer suggestions to make our show better for you. You can also send us an email at lostinrevisionpodcast at gmail.com. There's a lot more waiting for us all at the end of the road.